Well, we're at four o'clock now, and right. uh, we've got a lively crowd. Uh, so um, I'll let. You, well, uh, the, Eric, this is Eric Flynn, and uh, the uh, the presentation is group drawing activities. I'm very excited about this presentation because it's. Uh, it's about reducing stress and maximizing learning ability. So I think, yes, this is good. So uh, he'll be presenting this workshop on bringing drawing activities into your classroom, whether you use that yet or not, you might after his talk. Uh, I, I really, I can hardly wait. So welcome, Eric. And uh, if you could please just tell us a little bit about yourself before you start. Sure. Yeah, so uh, uh, my name is Eric Flynn, as you can see on the thing there. and. Uh, so I um, I started working in Korea since uh, about late 2009, and I, I kind of taught at pretty much all grade levels, uh, the elementary through you know adult. Most of my uh, experience is secondary education, but uh, right now I work at uh, Gifal, which is the Gyeonggi-do Institute for Language Education, and. Um, and uh, we kind of do a little bit of everything out here. Uh, has anyone heard of, of Giffel? Okay, well, uh, 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 Betsy has because she is my coworker and she sits right next to me at work. <laughs> but uh, and and by the way, she has uh, a presentation tomorrow, which uh, on digital media literacy, which is really good and helpful. So check that out if you have a moment. But uh, we kind of uh, we sort of take care of of the foreign language learning needs for Gyeonggi-do basically and sometimes that involves us uh, visiting you know schools to do some guest teaching but then we also have training for well, like a public school like Korean public school teachers they'll come to us to learn some teaching skills and we also have um, some training for foreign uh, English teachers as well and I think we have a session for that coming up sometime in the summer so if you you know if you like what you see here and, and you'd like to learn some more, you can join that. It's free. We have a blog as well, giffel.org, and uh, we put some posts on there. And actually, this uh, um, kind of a workshop that you're going to take today has uh, there's a, an article I posted on there that kind of has a lot of this information. It was from last year, but you can dig around there and check that out if you want. But uh, yeah, that's a, a little bit of an introduction from my end, and uh, I'm I'm glad to have you all here today. Ooh, sorry, one thing, Eric Flynn, Giffel.org, G-I-F-L dot org. Yes, um, I I believe that's it. But let me let me double check that because uh, it's. Um, I get I get the Gulf International Finance Limited. If oh I really? That. that I'm just so that I don't we don't send people to the wrong place. Oh no! It is giffel.org. Yeah, um, it. Uh, <laughs> so I don't. I don't know why you're getting the the golf one there, but uh, who who knows? Uh, it, you know, I'll copy and paste it in in the chat. Yeah, that would be here, great. And, uh, That'd be great. Thanks. Uh, let's see here. Ah, uh, E on the end. Ah, uh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, it, it stands for a uh, Gyeonggi-do Institute for Language Education. We right. the the four is actually part of the acronym on that one. <laughs> gotcha. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, I guess um, uh, I can go ahead and start here. Uh, so we do have a pretty small group here. Um, so, you know, uh, I did want to have like a little bit of uh, kind of breakout rooms and things, but maybe we won't need to do that. Uh, well, so anyway, we'll uh, we'll play it by ear. But let me uh, get my uh, PPT ready for you. Okay, I'm used to having a, a dual screen here, so if you see me kind of poking around a little bit and trying to figure out what to do, that's why. All right, so uh, again, welcome to Group Drawing Activities 101. Uh, so as you can see by the... So, um, sorry, I'm really sorry, Eric, I hate to interrupt you. Yeah, but no you're, Yeah, so your screen is, you're getting the, uh, the blocks, we're getting the, the gray blocks uh, in the middle of your screen, so we're not actually seeing your full screen, your... Uh, oh, really? Yeah, and I'm not sure what the fix is for that, uh, but hmm. uh, I think go out and come back in. Yeah, okay, from uh, from the, the meeting? 
No, just I think just your okay. yeah. Uh, uh, this anything... happened earlier to Lindsay, and she yeah. turned yeah. off the. Um, there's a setting related to sharing video, and she turned that off, and the box problem went away. Mm -hmm. Something about enhanced for for video. So if before you share, you turn off the enhanced for video setting, it stops the boxes, or at least it did for me. Okay. All right, well, let me uh, let me see if I can fix that really quickly. Um, okay, so there's a, an enhanced. Uh, this one says optimize for video clip, but that is not checked. Let's give this a try. How is that? Does that look better? I think so. I, yeah, most of them disappeared now. Okay, well, there we go. Mo most is good enough. Mm. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, as you can see, yeah, this is group group drawing activities 101. And uh, as you can tell from the, the 101 here, this is going to primarily focus on uh, pretty remedial stuff here the the basics so if you're looking for uh you know maybe um you know some kind of lesson on uh, advanced uh pedagogy with um you know on like uh, implementing single point rubrics in uh clil curricula then uh maybe this won't be your your cup of tea but if uh if you're looking to do uh, uh fun english time with pictures uh, then, then this will be right up your alley. All right. So, um, so first of all, let's do a little bit of a definition. So, what do I mean by drawing activities in this case? Well, there are a lot of different kinds of drawing activities, um, but the uh, the operant definition for this is uh, this is going to be an activity where you basically put students in groups, tell them something to draw, they draw it. And then they present it or they talk about it. Okay, um, it's uh, it's a pretty basic idea, and uh, I think it's something that um, it, it tends to be pretty popular amongst uh, foreign English teachers because uh, it, it's fairly easy to well, it's difficult to do poorly. All right, you, you'll usually get some kind of enthusiasm and participation from uh, the the students, but uh, the other side of that is it can be kind of difficult to run it really well and smoothly, and that's what we're going to work on today. All right, so um, so as you can see here, they're an easy way to teach students, but there are some ways you can teach them better. Um, now, before we get started, oh, by the way, uh, these can also be used for more than English. Um, you know, I think everyone here is an English teacher, but they also work for other subjects. They can they can work for other subjects as well. You know, like um, I remember one time I was uh, I had a you know like a, a science teacher, right? And it's like, well, you know, you, students can draw, you know, a, a diagram of something as a group, and so you can apply this to that as well. Um, okay, now before we before I you know get into my my lecture portion here. Uh, we can do a little bit of discussion. So I want you to kind of think about these. Um, so first of all, what do you think might be some advantages to group drawing activities? And then on the flip side, what are some disadvantages? Um, third, if you have done these before, what are some ones you've done? Uh, I know some of you might never have done these. Some of you might have tried a lot of these. And uh, in the event that you have done these, do you have any tips, things that worked well or things that didn't work well? If you don't, if you haven't done these and you don't have any tips, that's perfectly fine because then you wouldn't need me, <laughs> right? You wouldn't need to take this course. But uh, if you have done this uh, and, and you have any experiences, either positive or negative, uh, you can talk about that, all right? So um, let me stop sharing so I can see my gallery view here. Um, so just a, just a show of hands, has anyone tried to do something like this in their class before? Okay, Brian has, and so has Lucinda. Okay, and, and Jocelyn as well, everyone. Okay, so what, um, so what are some things, some good things, some bad things about, about these activities, uh, in your opinion? 
Yeah, Jocelyn. Students sometimes feel shy to draw if they don't feel particularly talented at that. And yeah, that's a good point. I tried to demonstrate by showing them my natural Picasso drawings. <laughs> sometimes uh, yeah. that helps. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, I'm glad you brought that up because um, uh, later on we'll see that one kind of important uh, part of this activity is to give them kind of your own example or like a demonstration. And, and uh, you know, when I do that, I'll, you know, draw something really quickly for them. And sometimes I, I intentionally make it kind of sub quality, you know, so that way they know, hey, you know, like, Mr. Flynn's not a great drawer, and, and that's okay. You know, it lets them know that it's, they don't have to be experts at this. Yeah, uh, very good point on that one. Um, uh, and other thoughts? Yeah, Brian. Uh, I agree that often it gets out a lot of ideas from students and a lot of language but i think sometimes they draw an idea that they don't know how to express in mm. english so sometimes yeah. it it activates all of this stuff that they then can't do or they're not ready to do in english yet so that might be a drawback yeah good i'm glad you brought that up too and i hopefully i'll have uh, a few solutions for you uh, today but we'll see okay um other things yeah, Betsy. Yeah, I think that drawing in, you know, kind of anything else that expresses creativity in, you know, kind of a physical form, uh, we as teachers might know all of the pedagogy behind that and all the good things that are coming from it. But if your supervisor is walking by your classroom and ah. these kids are, you know, arts and crafts time, it can, you know, come off as something that is not necessarily tied to the curriculum. So I think there's that disconnect between what we're doing in class and what we know the kids are doing and maybe what the supervisor or the parents are seeing. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's a good point. Uh, I think we've all had kind of one of those moments where like the, you know, the the principal or whatever comes in at the wrong time, you know, and, and we're like, no, we're, we're working really. <laughs> but yeah, and unfortunately, I, I think that's, I, I don't have a, a, a real good workaround for that. But uh, yeah, that's something that that's definitely a, a reality of these kinds of activities. Yeah, uh, other thoughts, either good things or bad things about this kind of activity. Okay. Oh, uh, Lucinda, were, were you going to say something? I was going to say, say uh, that if you're doing drawing activities, you have to have the supplies for however many students you have. And yeah, that can be difficult either carrying them around or getting them in the first place. Yeah, you bet. That's that's a big disadvantage, too. And uh, again, I hope to have some advice that will mitigate that uh, at least partially, but uh, maybe not not totally. Unfortunately, that is a, a disadvantage. All right. Anything else uh, on that? Three, two, one. I'm yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, uh, right. Um, now, uh, for those of you who have done this, what are what are some some things that you've had students draw? And, and um, well, yeah, uh, any uh, anyone want to share about that? Some some things you've had them do or projects you've had. If if not, that's okay. I don't know whether the uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I don't know whether the. I talked to you earlier about uh, having the kids, um, we, were, we were trying to do a video and they weren't, they didn't want to be in the video, of course. And so yeah. they, we recorded them, the audio part, but then they just drew on the whiteboard the activities and we just took individual pictures and did sort of a stop action thing with that. That was sort of the extent of my experience with using drawings yeah and and, and that's uh that's kind of a good way for how to get around some of the uh the supply issue like you can just um have them draw on and actually i, I did not really think about that uh, myself greg but um you, you know so taking pictures of the drawings and then and then displaying it can be helpful and uh you can do that with individual whiteboards which we'll talk about or you can do that with one big whiteboard as well, or A4 paper also works. Uh, if you don't have like something, you know, one, one kind of disadvantage is you need to be able to display it to the class. And so that kind of requires some sort of big whiteboards, right? Um, which are difficult to lug around. But if you don't have those, uh, or if they're inconvenient, you can just take a, a picture of like some A4 paper they're working on, and then put that on like a computer screen or something like that. Now that can be difficult to do 
in that very class session, but you, it's something that you can do for, you know, maybe a follow-up, right? So, oh, last week you drew pictures. Now this week we're going to present them and look at them. And then you have them uh, on, you know, the cloud storage or uh, your computer or, or whatever. So that's uh, one, one thing you can do there. Um, okay. And anything else, other experiences that uh, anyone has to share? Yeah, Lucinda. I've done uh, self-introduction collages before, hmm. like with a sort of a self-portrait, but with uh, different things about themselves, a picture presenting their hobbies, pets, family, and then they had to explain the, the collage later when they introduced themselves. Yeah, that's a good idea. I like that. Now, now with that one, did they like cut pictures out or did, did they draw them or how did they do that? I've done it both ways. I've done it in online classes where it was sort of a, a shared Google slide where they okay. would make a collage of different pictures they put on their slide and then face to face they would draw the the different things representing themselves. Okay, that's a really cool idea. Uh, how did that work? Did, was it uh, pretty, were the results pretty positive? Yeah, I, I, the some of the online versions got a little bit too well literal. Like this is <laughs> literally a my cat. This is literally my family. And uh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. But the the face to face ones were were pretty good, pretty reliably good. I think mm, where okay. students drew things and then had to explain it because you know like like Jocelyn was saying, our natural born Picasso drawings are pretty good for explanations later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Good. Oh, that's an interesting idea. I, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up. Uh, anything else? Yeah, Brian. Uh, Brian, and then we'll go Jocelyn and then Lisa. Okay, go ahead, Brian. Um, my favorite that I've done in the past couple of years is having students design a new logo that means English language. You know, when you're choosing languages, it always shows like the American flag or British flag. Yeah. So I show them those and then we talk about other like other possibilities, global context, that kind of thing. And then I just give them a paper with a circle on it and they design a new logo to mean English. And yeah. it gets out a lot of different designs and discussion. And I it's a nice way to set up a, set up the year, I think. Yeah, great idea. Uh, yeah, I've, we've done a little bit of logo design, or uh, and by we I mean I. <laughs> I've done a little bit of uh, you know kind of logo designing projects in the past too. Usually works pretty well. It's it's a good experience for them. And, um, you know, especially like Korean students, they, they love logos and brands and that kind of thing. And that's a lot of fun for them. Uh, Jocelyn, what about you? Sure, yeah. Um, I do different things depending on the levels of my learners. So I don't teach low level English classes, mm. but I teach Spanish, introductory mm. Spanish. And uh, so those students are really, they just need vocabulary. Um, uh, so basically, I just ask them to study a certain number of words for that chapter before we study it. And I want, I don't want them to just like make word lists, but I ask them to draw a picture and then that picture needs to connect a certain number of the words on the list. So they first need to learn the words or translate them and then they need to draw a picture or a scene, a story where all these words fit in somehow. And I, I think that's quite fun and creative and I like to see how they combine them. And then for more advanced learners, for example, I might use it as a warm up activity for writing. So maybe they're not talking about it orally, but they'll be writing about it after. So if they're writing about a place, then I'll ask them to sketch that place, for example. And then it's easier for them to maybe describe it later, so. Okay. Yeah, the, the, both great ideas. I, I had the, the word list, I had never thought about that. I, I like that idea a lot. Uh, that, that's kind of the good thing about these uh, these conferences is we can get a lot of new ideas from that. Uh, Lisa, uh, what about you? We do a lot of storybook reading and discussions. So it's nice, like say one Friday a month or something, I just let them draw pictures about their favorite storybook scene. Hmm. And then when they finish their picture, I ask them to tell me about what they've drawn and I'll ask them a few questions about it. It's a nice break from the usual routine and it gives them, you know, something to talk about as well. Yeah, great. Yeah, perfect example. Okay, good. And uh, I know we've we've got a, a couple of participants with without uh, camera sharing. So uh, feel free. Um, Crystal and Christopher, if, if you have something uh, to, to say, just feel free to interrupt me at any time. I know uh, Zoom also has that little hand raise uh, icon and you can use that if, if you need 
to say something as well. But and that goes for any of you. If you have something that you, feel free to interrupt me with questions at, at any time. Um, you know, and I always tell people this is, you know, this is your your workshop, right? Uh, it, I, I'm driving the car, but the car belongs to you. So uh, if you have questions about anything and you want to go off on a tangent, that's fine. Uh, by the way, uh, really quickly, um, you know, I, is there anyone here uh, visiting from, from outside of Korea? Oh, okay, so sometimes we get uh, uh, people attend from other countries. Um, okay, and uh, keep in mind, um, this, uh, you know, usually we think of like uh, children for this sort of activity, but it does work for adults as well. Like uh, adults, they, they like to draw and things too. Uh, you might have to change a little bit about the uh, the theme and the like, but um, it also, I've done this with similar things with uh, adult learners too. Okay, so let's move on here. Um, and uh, one minute here, I'm trying to get my gallery view synced with my PPT. As I mentioned, I usually do this on a dual screen computer. So, um, well, okay, I, I, I can't see you on Zoom, so uh, I, I can't see your faces. So please uh, interrupt me if you want me to go back and, and say anything. All right, so these are kind of, um, oh, you cannot see my screen, can you? Let's do that now. All right, hopefully you can see that okay. And uh, also feel free to, to type in the chat window as well if you need me to stop or repeat anything. So yeah, these are kind of some advantages and disadvantages. We talked about some of these. Uh, for younger students, uh, it bolsters teamwork skills for one thing. Uh, you know, they, they have to learn how to listen to each other and that sort of thing. Uh, of course, it's fun, you know, well, usually. Um, it, it can be good for students who are not particularly strong at English because, uh, you know, maybe English is not their strong suit, but they really enjoy drawing. That can be, this can be a way to motivate them. Uh, of course, it, it strengthens creativity. Uh, some disadvantages are sometimes you'll get non-participatory students every now and then you'll, especially in like high school, you'll get a team and there'll be a, you know, one student who just goes to sleep or whatever. Um, it can be a little bit chaotic. You know, you can uh, usually get a lot of energy. Out. So the an advantage is there's usually a lot of energy from this. A disadvantage is that there's usually a lot of energy from this. <laughs> so uh, sometimes you'll have disagreements. Uh, nowadays, uh, you know, COVID is kind of, um, you know, it's not as big of an issue as it used to be. But that can also be an issue too. Maybe you have to do classes online or something like that. Um, all right. So anyway, uh, at this point, I'm going to take you through a sort of step-by-step -step process. And uh, as I was telling uh, Greg at the beginning, uh, this is something that over my years of teaching, I, I kind of fine-tuned and um, you know, I got it to almost down to a science. And I learned a lot of little tips that can help uh, facilitate things and help them go, go more smoothly. All right, so we'll take this through you one step at a, take you through this one step at a time. So first of all, uh, of course, decide on a theme. Think about, you know, what you want them to draw, right? Of course, that should be, you know, fairly common sense, right? And also think about what vocabulary or grammar you want them to target, all right? Um, and this can be, uh, a helpful thing to keep in mind. Now, it partly depends on, well, it, it fully depends on what your your language learning outcomes are or your, your goals. What do you want them to learn from this? Uh, a lot of uh, new teachers that do this, they'll kind of just be like, all right, uh, draw a superhero. All right, now let's talk about it. And that can be okay, uh, especially for, you know, maybe some, some advanced students. They can, uh, you know, recall a lot of English that they've studied before. It, it can be good review. Uh, but for a lot of uh, typical students, it, again, it's not useless, but it kind of lacks focus. So you do want to think about like a specific thing that you want them to do, usually. Uh, again, for like, you know, more advanced learners, you don't need this, but it's usually good to have some kind of focus. And that can be as simple as just 
vocabulary words, or it can be grammar, or you can kind of combine them depending on what you want to do. Okay, so next you prepare your materials. Um, so if you're doing this online, you can use Jamboard. And again, uh, nowadays we're doing fewer and fewer uh, online, um, online courses, but, uh, but it's still relevant. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Lisa was asking, uh, will I be sharing the slides in Discord later? Actually, yeah, I, I don't, uh, I haven't been using the Discord here, but uh, if you like these, uh, if you like this presentation, um, I'll give you, I'll try to, I'll try to do it on Discord. I'll give it a try, Lisa, but uh, I, I can't guarantee you uh, that it, it'll work. So I'll also give you my email at the end of the course. And if you'd like this, uh, this PPT, I can email it to you as well. Um, anyway, so Jamboard, uh, I think most of you might know how to do this, but let me show you how I did this really quickly. Um, and let me stop sharing my screen for just a moment to reduce uh, your clutter a little bit here. But um, all righty. So uh, Jamboard, uh, for those of you who don't know about this, it's a um, it's a, a Google program, and basically you just post things. And you can see, you can uh, online, you can have teams do things, you know, on it this way. They can draw things, and that can take the place of a whiteboard. I'll give you a few more tips about that a little bit later. Um, now, if you're doing this offline. You can use just one big whiteboard, as uh, as Greg mentioned, um, but uh, I usually like to get small ones. Usually, uh, about you know this size works. Depending on your class size, you'll want about about seven per class maximum. Now, if uh, if you don't have those, you can use laminated paper, like a, a simple sheet of B4 paper, laminated, also works. And I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that. I did not realize this until like a couple of years ago, <laughs> but uh, it works great. Uh, you don't have to lug around those big boards, so do that. And as I said earlier, you can also just photograph things and display those as well. Uh, of course, you'll want one marker per board, but maybe more. There's always one of them that runs dry. Uh, erasers. Now, uh, as uh, I believe it was Lucinda, she was saying earlier, you know, it's really, a, it can be a lot of effort to kind of lug around those boards, markers, and as we'll see later, you'll have some papers and handouts too. And when you have all of those things, like having erasers and something else to carry can be a, a, a real burden. Um, in my experience, most students will find a way to erase without erasers. Uh, usually there'll be like tissues or something like that in the room that they can use. The last school I taught at did not, and that was a bit of an issue, but generally you don't need to bring erasers and just having one less thing to keep track of can be really helpful. Uh, and then finally handouts or worksheets or whatever you wanna call them are very important. Um, we'll talk about this in just a moment. Oh, and from uh, in case, uh, for those of you who didn't notice the chat from Brian, he recommends uh, an app called Cam Scanner, uh, which automatically crops to the edge of the paper and makes the colors really crisp. Uh, all right, thanks, Brian. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check that out, Cam Scanner. Um, oh, okay, and, and from Greg, uh, students can draw on the windows. That's a good idea. I, I had not thought about that. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm sure they love that, right? <laughs> like they get to draw right on the windows. Uh, great idea. All right, yeah, okay. Uh, any uh, any other questions or comments so far? Okay. Um, again, I, I can't see the, the gallery view anymore, so <laughs> keep in mind, I cannot see you. Uh, all right, so let's talk about handouts just a little bit. So now uh, these are kind of important. And earlier, uh, Brian was talking about, you know, sometimes you get students, they really, they'll draw something, but then they don't know how to express it. And so um, it can be very helpful that you create some, uh, some guides and things to help them scaffold their English. There are many ways you can do this. 
but um, let me share just a few examples. So um, one activity that I often do is I'll have them draw monsters. And the goal of this lesson is to familiarize themselves, uh, familiarize, to become familiar with uh, names for animal parts, all right? And so what I'll do is, you know, I'll, I'll usually teach them, you know, some of these. This is for a high school class, by the way. So these are a bit more advanced. But, uh, and then I will give each of them this uh, B4, uh, A4 handout, right? So they can, you know, as they're doing their drawing, they have that as a reference that they can look at, all right? Um, and each student gets that. Then what I do is uh, I have this here and you can see this is a double handout. So you can, you know, tear it in half and you give one of these to each team. All right. And so what this does is it lets them prepare their English as they are doing their drawing. And so this way, when it's time to present, you know, you won't have this thing where you go, all right, team A. Tell us about what you drew. And they're like, uh, uh, you know, they'll have it ready to go. Uh, now, uh, of course, one of the disadvantages is there is most of them will probably just read it. Um, and uh, it, it's really up to you, um, what, again, what your goal is there. <clears throat> uh, generally, uh, creating uh, extemporaneous uh, speaking among students is a pretty tall order and kind of requires uh, a, a pretty extensive class, but, um, you know, that is kind of, uh, uh, anyway, but th this is very helpful. It gets them to, to prepare their English. Um, you can see, I usually like to leave a little area down here. So, you know, if there's a particularly precocious student, uh, they can, uh, you know, do a little bit of experimentation and fill that out. They never do, <laughs> but you know the options there for differentiation. You can also consider scaffold the, scaffolding these a little bit more if you feel like your students need help. Like here's an example, right? So this one, you can give them for you know if they need a little bit of extra help, you can do this. So they can be like, oh, it has a tail, it has a shell, you know, something like that. I'll give you all a few seconds to look at that. Or uh, something like this would also be appropriate. Okay, again, they have, you know, maybe, uh, you know, some, some uh, scaffolding support where they can fill things in. And this can kind of guide them to uh, meet your, your language uh, objectives or your, your learning objectives, as it were, and focus on things. Uh, again, for, for very advanced students, you could just have them speak off the cuff, but um, generally that's going to be pretty difficult to do. Uh, let's see. Oh, and uh, if you're using J uh, Jamboard, yeah, uh, and and uh, good good point from Jocelyn there. Jocelyn says, well, due to the setup, you can guess that some some students might write it has a horns, and that's a good point. And um, you know, maybe this is uh, that's something that. Uh, is perhaps better left to a, a class on scaffolding, but yeah. And so in that case, you know, this would be something for maybe a, it really doesn't match this handout. You'd maybe want to get either get rid of things that are, you know, plural, or in that case, uh, you could have maybe like this in parentheses or something like that. So, uh, you know, how you scaffold it kind of depends on uh, what words you're using and that sort of thing. But that's definitely something to think about. Um, last year, I did teach a class on, on how to do all of this kind of thing, and it, it can get kind of complicated, but that's always something you want to consider when you uh, scaffold your, uh, your uh, handouts like this. Yeah, good point. And that can be kind of challenging. Uh, if you are using Jamboard, you can, uh, of course, you can uh, upload these things, but uh, sometimes students aren't really good at downloading or maybe they don't want to, in which case you can, uh, let me see if I can find my Jamboard once again. You can kind of uh, upload these as backgrounds and then so they can kind of look at this. And um, again, I don't want to get too deep into how to use Jamboard here, but you do, you upload it as, uh, no, I'm sorry, you don't do that. You upload it as 
uh, set background is what you do and you upload that as a picture and that way they cannot move it or delete it. Okay, but anyway, you can do that and then they can look at it. Uh, kind of some scaffolding templates there, an example. All right. Okay. And let me get my PPT back again. There we go. Um, this is something that, um, you know, and you can put this, uh, I would usually put this on the screen. So then again, they've also got like it. So you can use a variety of different, I call them handouts, but they're not really, you know, so each student has a vocabulary list. Each team has kind of a paper for them to organize their English. And then you have this maybe on the screen so they can look at that for a little bit more help. You know, so there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, provide support for their English. Um, and you can also use your, your textbook can also be a handout, right? You can tell them, look on page, you know, 10 of your textbook for these, for the words that you need. All right, but anyway, the point is, um, Think of some, some ways, some things you can give them that can give them that support, all right? And don't be afraid to think outside the box. There are a lot of different ways to do this, um, you know, and, and you don't have to do it just that way. I think uh, I got another example for you somewhere. Let me stop my screen share for just a minute. Uh, here's another example. This was for a sign making activity we did. Share my screen again. Um, so they, uh, you know, this is a handout and it gave them a list of different projects to, uh, to write down. Okay. And they would choose one. And then at the end, they had, you know, kind of some words to help them. This was for a more advanced class, right? But that, that can also be a handout. So lots of, lots of different ways you can do that. It doesn't have to follow the example I gave. All right, uh, any questions so far? Well, I got too many windows here. All right, okay. Um, so next you get to the teaching port. So you've, uh, you've chosen a theme, you have your materials ready, now it's time to actually start the class, all right? So um, so how do you teach them? Well, so this is, of course, where you teach them the vocabulary and the grammar they need. Now, uh, this depends on how your classroom is set up. But, uh, you know, with some, um, some classrooms, the students are always in groups. But usually in the ones that I teach in, uh, they're seated at desks, all right? And when I teach, I don't put them in groups at the beginning. Uh, now for adults, it's different, but for like high school and below, once you put them in a group, they stop listening to you. They'll be looking at each other and, and talking and that sort of thing. And there's just too many distractions. So I usually keep them in their regular class order, okay? Otherwise, once they're in groups, you know, it, <laughs> it goes in and it comes out. All right. Uh, now, at this point, you go over your rules and expectations and what those are are up to you. But these are some things I recommend. Uh, now, this one might seem a little bit um, a little bit surprising, but I always tell them, don't draw other students faces on your projects. OK, and, and I, I tell you, like, at least in high school, it's it's a hard and fast rule with every class. When you do a drawing project, at least one team will try to draw another classmate's face on it. And sometimes this comes from a place of love, but sometimes it comes from a place of scorn. And, and sometimes students use it to sort of covertly tease or bully. Um, I, as a uh, uh, non-Korean speaker, have a difficult time telling which is which. And so I just tell them, don't, don't draw other students' faces. I see it, you know, like I've seen it too many times. It's not interesting to me. Okay, don't do it. Uh, no, <clears throat> you know, weird stuff, right? They, they like to make their drawings anatomically correct sometimes, <laughs> right? Um, if you're using Jamboard, no Jamboard vandalism, okay? You can draw on other people's Jamboards. 
And as far as, um, you know, enforcing these rules, well, that's maybe a class for another day. All right. Um, but, uh, you know, I usually tell them, well, um, at a, a previous school, we had something that were called self-design cards, where if a student, you know, did something wrong, they had to get it signed by other teachers. They hated it. And I told them, I said, you know, if you do these things, I'm going to give you a self-design card. And, you know, one group, they, uh, you know, they, they tried to push the limits. And so I'm like, well, I, I told you, you know, here you go, self-design card. And they were like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, so they knew. Um, and then give an example if you can. All right. So, you know, doing one of your own, that can uh, show them what the, you know, what they are supposed to do. Um, I think on, on Jamboard, uh, again, I kind of gave a bit of an example. Um, let me see if I can bring that up once more. I don't know why this keeps coming up. Uh, one moment. I appreciate your patience with this, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'll show that to you later, but uh, let's, uh, let's move on uh, for now. All right. But anyway, yeah, I usually put like with Jamboard, I'll put my example at the end. Okay, any questions on that so far? All right. So next, you form groups. Uh, and generally, I usually go about four to five students per group. Um, and some people will even claim five is too much. I usually do okay with that. Um, but six, uh, it's not the end of the world, but there's probably going to be at least one student that doesn't really learn a whole lot because the group is too big. There's too much diffusion of, you know, responsibility. Uh, I, I don't recommend groups of more than six, uh, maybe about five to seven groups per class, because remember, you do have to have each team present. And if you're doing like a lot of them, that's a long time that students have to sit and pay attention. That's a lot of class time as well. So um, uh, I know with like, like a secondary education, generally there's gonna be about 35 students uh, per class. So seven works pretty well. Eight, again, you can do it, but it's getting to be a bit much. Um, you know, so now as far as how you group them, there are two methods here. The easy one is that you just tell them students that are sitting near each other, you know, okay, make a team, make a team, right? Okay. Um, so that's how you do that. Now for the, the more thorough method, you can give each student a group role. And uh, so what you would do is, you know, maybe, you know, you say, you know, one student is the, uh, the writer, in, unless you, you want all of them to write, which is also okay. You know, one student is maybe the, the judge where if there's a disagreement, uh, this student will decide whose choice uh, gets chosen. Uh, you can have one student be like a timekeeper to keep track of time and so on and so forth. Uh, and generally most teachers I've spoken to uh, have reported pretty positive results with this method, but it also requires some organization. Uh, and uh, it's something that you kind of have to work uh, with the students uh, on before that, okay? Because if you've only got like 40 or 50 minutes per class, it doesn't seem like it would take a lot of time, but it does. And uh, it, it, every, every minute counts with some of these classes. And so, um, like, uh, again, if you've been working with these students quite a bit, you can set that up at the beginning. But uh, if it's just like a class that you're doing right away, it might be difficult to incorporate that. Um, and just a hint also for, uh, for um, you know, uh, teachers who have to, um, you know, who, who, who are teaching Korean students but don't speak Korean well. Um, uh, one way you can do this is... Uh, a lot of times, if you just tell students make a group, they won't know what to do. So what, what you have to do is you have to go, okay, you, 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 and you, please stand up. Okay, now move your desks together. All right, now the rest of you, when I point to you, do the same thing. 
Okay, one, two, three, four, make a group. If you don't demonstrate it like that, they won't know what to do. And you usually have to do that every time you make groups, even if the students have done it before. All right, we gotta go a little bit quick. Um, so anyway, here you pass out supplies. You can consider having a student help you with that one. That can uh, save you time, all right? So those are groups. Uh, now, this is where they do their group work, all right? So fairly common sense, walk around, offer advice. Time limits are helpful, okay? If you don't give them a time limit, they'll work forever. And um, try going to onlinestopwatch.com. There are probably some other apps that some of you know about, but you can put like a clock on the screen and let them know. Um, of course, in Zoom, go into the breakout rooms. Um, make sure students are in their seats if you're teaching uh, high school or below. Um, because a lot of times students are tempted to get up and move around the room. And, and you know, they do have that energy, but that very quickly leads to chaos. All right. So usually, you know, oh, no, wait, please sit down. Even, even if you're done, you know, sit down because things get out of control. All right. Um, should you let students use Korean during group work? Well, it, it's up to you. It depends on the level. I usually do just because, um, again, what is your goal here? Uh, you know, you're getting them to, to practice these grammar structures or these vocabulary words. And uh, a lot of times, if you have them like speak only English, that's a, in my experience, that's a pretty tall order. Uh, so I usually say it's okay, but different people have different opinions on that. Uh, if you don't think you're gonna have enough time, go around and write the, so if you teach multiple classes, like when I you know, taught high school, I had nine different classes, you know, write their, uh, if you're using boards, write their class number on each board. So when you take a picture of it and you put that on your, your computer, you can look at the picture and be like, oh, this is class two dash nine. And you can organize those appropriately. Uh, and then finally, when they present. So take students out of their groups. Uh, again, if they're still in their groups, they're gonna be talking and stuff like that. Collect the drawing supplies. Two minutes left. Collect the drawing supplies. Again, they'll keep drawing if you don't. Uh, try to make sure all students present, okay? Have them, again, how they divide that up is up to them, but usually like one sentence per student. And they do need that preparation time, which is why they have the handouts, all right? Um, and so there's that. Uh, if there isn't enough time in class and you wanna take uh, have them present next class, you'll usually wanna start clean up about five minutes early. That, that's about how much time it takes to get all the drawing supplies. Uh, and then as I mentioned, you take the pictures. Uh, up here, you can see where I wrote the uh, the class number. This was uh, S class, uh, classes one, two, and three. So you can easily look at those and do that. Of course, you don't have to worry about that with Jamboard. Uh, as far as those papers that they wrote their English on for their presentations, it's up to you. You can collect those if you want, or you can leave it to the students. And if the students forget them or lose them, well, you know, well, that's that's life, kids, right? Sometimes you know they learn a lesson in maintaining their uh, their items and their responsibility. All right, so that is it. One minute to spare. Uh, I went through that last part pretty quickly, but hopefully that was helpful. Um, before we finish up, are, are there uh, any questions or anything that uh, is on your mind? Just your uh, your email was just brief there. Uh, yeah, let me. If uh, we could it, put it in the chat, maybe. Yes, I, I will put that in the uh, in the chat here. Just a moment. Um, it is uh, Eric Giffel at gmail .com. There it is. So um, feel free to you know that that's uh, feel free to send me any questions, hate mail, whatever, <laughs> and. Uh, and I'll try to get around to those. 
Um, well, great, uh, great presentation, Eric. I really appreciate your enthusiasm and uh, and your insight. You've uh, it sounds like you've uh, taken something that seems simple anybody can do, but we all kind of suffer through it. But uh, you've uh, organized it and uh, and made it uh, something that we could probably make better use of. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks for participating.